I want to first situate things, if you want, in terms of the economic crisis. The economic crisis that began in 2008 has had a profound impact on European and other societies. Political responses have ranged from the convulsions of Greece to Britain's referendum to leave the European Union. Spain has been in one sense a place that has experienced a scale of responses given its own internal dynamics and semi-federal political system. The economic crisis in Spain has greatly challenged the relatively stable political order that emerged in the mid-1970s following the transition from the Franco dictatorship. Whilst traditional class and religious cultures have declined and fragmented in contemporary Spain, conflicts over national identity remain unresolved, with the current Spanish state order subject to profound challenge by Catalan secession. The economic crisis has given impetus to forms of nationalist mobilisation, with Scotland, Catalonia and Flanders experiencing secessionist pressures. Catalonia has been at the epicentre of Spain's territorial crisis. Catalonia is a historically rich region with a profound sense of national and cultural identity, and it has embraced secession as the potential solution to an accumulation of grievances. Difficult economic times have combined with a, with a profound psychological need to protect one's own, however defined, first. Social class or traditional working class solidarity movements have mostly been unable to compete with movements that posit the defence of the nation, of identity and the national before other variables. However, there has been nothing inevitable about the turn to secession in Catalonia. The situation that has brought close to half of the Catalan population to express support for independence has varied causes. As recently as the mid-2000s, Catalonia was described as, and analysed by scholars, as a non-secessionist nationalism. The Spanish state seemed to be on a journey towards an authentic federal order, and was generally admired. Catalonia was seen within Europe and beyond as a role model for successful devolution, which had much to teach other parts of the world. Catalan nationalism then, while seeking to deepen and extend the regional powers obtained in the late 1970s, was non-secessionist. And the unwillingness to seek secession within Catalonia was deeply rooted in the territory and overwhelmingly shared across the political spectrum. Until the early 1990s, no member of the Catalan Regional Parliament was openly in favour of secession. And even in 1999, a party in favour of Catalan independence did not obtain even 10% of the vote in the Catalan elections. By 2000, Catalan society was little prone to political conflict and tension in Spain on the national question remained focused on the Basque country, which was gradually approaching a post-violent scenario. In these years, there was no reason to believe that in a few years, Catalonia would embark on a political project that would break a 120-year culture of building and consolidating autonomy. However, by the 1990s, there were traceable the first indications that contrary to appearances, Catalan society was less than content. The party system was increasingly in flux, mirroring developments in other European societies where challenger parties of varying hues began to emerge. The credit and property boom that began in the mid-1990s delayed recognition that salaries particularly for the middle classes, were stagnating. Whilst industrial and other workers had experienced instability since the late 1970s, this did not begin to occur amongst middle class sectors until two decades later. New generations reaching adulthood no longer had the automatic political loyalty of the previous generation, and the two main parties in Catalonia, nationalists and social democrats, increasingly struggled to obtain new voters. Intra-generational mobility was halting, and a generational breach was increasingly emerging between those over 40 with comparative employment stability and the young 
increasingly struggling to obtain access to the property market or employment stability. These trends would find expression in the economic crisis that challenged Spain after 2008. We also have political trends, political changes. And the first one I want to bring in here is the Partido Popular, Spain's Conservative Party, and what I call the turn towards centralization. The Conservative Partido Popular governments of 1996 to 2004 increasingly sought to halt the process of further devolution in Spain that had been made possible by the ambiguities of the constitutional and territorial settlement of the late 1970s. The Spanish model, one we can call semi-federalism, began to be first questioned by the centre, not the periphery. And here we can begin to trace the emergence of a Catalan existential crisis as its comparative importance in the Spanish political system began to decline. Simply put, Catalonia had lost its leading role in the political and economic development of Spain, which had been a central element to the narrative of political Catalanism since its emergence in the 1880s. As such, one key pillar of Catalanism had collapsed through the economic, political and cultural development of the wider Spanish polity. Through the combination of these trends I've outlined, the Catalan political class became increasingly conscious of the need for renewal of the political project for Catalonia. And the solution proposed became a profound revision to the Catalan Statute of Autonomy of 1979. This was broadly seen as an opportunity to update autonomy and bring it into line with the social and economic changes that had occurred since the late 1970s. This period, which began in 2003 and lasted until 2006, i.e. the reform of the regional government system, was simply a reformist project. The Catalan goal of what was termed asymmetrical federalism increasingly clashed with state trends of re-centralization. An ever more confident Spanish nationalism, mostly mobilised around conservative sectors and the Partido Popular, the Popular Party, saw the Catalan Estatut as a political opportunity to halt any further devolution of powers to Catalonia. Thus, the Popular Party and media allies in Madrid sought to mobilise against what was in practice simply a technocratic piece of legislation. Petitions were organised throughout Spain against a statute that was portrayed as leading to the breakup of Spain. Here we have today's current Spanish Prime Minister standing in front of what he claimed were four million signatures he had collected throughout Spain to stop the reform of Catalonia's self-government. Okay, so this is modest measures of increased powers for the region were interpreted by the Popular Party, by Madrid, as a threat to the very unity of Spain. And this is 2004, 2005. Here we find then an increasing clash between a more assertive Spanish nationalism and a Catalanism that, that seemed increasingly defensive and in search of new rhetorical tools. In June 2010, after an impasse of four years, the Spanish Supreme Court issued its judgment on the revised Statute of Autonomy, providing its definition of what it termed the constitutional limits of regional governance. And in July 2010, over one million Catalans took to the streets of Barcelona to protest against the decision of Spain's Supreme Court under the slogan, we are a nation and we decide. This moment was a major expression, i.e. the summer of 2010, of popular sovereignty that it was not yet an explicit turn to independence. This moment can be interpreted as the first major articulation of what in time has become known as the right to decide, a political mechanism to express Catalan self-determination. 
What we can call then the autonomous semi-federal model of the post-Franco era, established by the Spanish Constitution of 1978, was increasingly rejected in Catalonia. And Spain's territorial crisis began with Catalonia at its epicenter. Support for an independent Catalan state expanded from 13.6% in 2005 to figures approaching 48 or 50% in 2015. We don't need to be worried too much about what it's showing up, but this is the green line, essentially very little movement between 2005 and 2009, 2010. Suddenly an explosion and the green line expresses what seems to be support for independence approaching half of the population. And these other two are support for federalism or sort for the, relig um, the regional system, which collapse. So you can trace a dramatic moment when those things happen. So parties and movements then, supportive of Catalan independence, have moved from the margins to the political mainstream. And an exceptionally high degree of social mobilization has sought to channel these grievances through a mass movement of independ for independence. Catalonia has experienced the largest series of popular mobilizations ever seen in modern Europe. 2012. 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, and 2017, okay? So every year on Catalonia's National Day, we have seen a constant demonstration of social support for independence. Independence then became the largest single expression in contemporary Catalan society and one that is impossible to ignore. It has been fueled by resentment and frustration at the limitations of autonomy, by the wounds of historical memory, and anger engendered by the economic crisis. The model that governed Catalan-Spanish relations after 1978 has broken. We can note then that both Catalan and Basque sovereignty movements, the Catalan sovereignty movement, if you want, appeared after the Basque sovereignty movement, began as, part, as movements that were partly resistant to state re-centralisation. And this bears important parallels with, for example, Quebec, which undertook its second referendum in 1995 as a direct response as per perceived encroachment by the central Canadian states. Thus, historic nations without a state are highly sensitive to any reclaiming of power by the centre. We now need to consider what I call, well, what we can call Spanish nationalism and its current nature. Spanish nationalism, of course, was deeply damaged by its appropriation by Francoism, by the Franco regime, and both Spanish socialists and conservatives seemed unable to create a new model of the nation. The Franco regime prevented the re-emergence of a strident form of Spanish nationalism in the immediate post-transition -tran era of the late 1970s and 1980s. It was not until the mid-1990s, with a new generation appearing, that a new Spanish nationalism emerged, untainted by association with the Franco dictatorship. With the reconfiguration and revival of Spanish nationalism over the course of the 1990s, the scene was set for an impending clash of nationalist narratives with a renewed Spanish nationalism clashing with the Catalan nationalism. Catalan national narrative, sorry. In particular, under the second administration of José María Aznar, of between 2000 and 2004, Spanish national unity became a mobilizing narrative for Spain's Conservative Party. They put a giant flag in the, in the center of Madrid to remind people how big and important the Spanish nation is, which is still there. In the absence then of an external enemy, Spanish nationalism mobilised against its internal opponents on the periphery. 
The mobilization of, of Spanish conservatism against the Estatut seemed part of an increasingly belligerent Spanish nationalism and greatly contributed to the fracturing of the relative consensus of Spain's transition to democracy. The popular party, Partido Popular, increasingly came to be perceived, came to be perceived as an anti-Catalan party, and its arrival in, par in power in November 2011 with a full majority was portrayed in those terms within a society increasingly turning towards independence. A clash of political values became evident, as did ever greater estrangement between Madrid and Barcelona. So where has the movement come from? Where has the movement, if you want, that has been so successful in terms of display, where has it come from? Well, firstly, 100 years of what we call political Catalanism has produced a political culture, a vast associational life, and varied intellectual currents. This movement, whose basic parameters have been shared by broad sectors of both political elites and society, undertook a dedicated, if piecemeal, project of nation building through education, media and cultural policies. This has facilitated a Catalanist dominance in the self-governing institutions of Catalonia. The movement for Catalan independence has built upon the essential tenant, tenets of Catalan political culture. These have included a profound loyalty to Catalan institutions as ultimate repositories of Catalan legitimacy and national representation. Why Catalonia and why not elsewhere, given that Spain has other territorial issues? Firstly, there has not been a Galician, Valencian or Canary Island territorial crisis in the past 10 years. More importantly, there has not been a Basque territorial crisis, the absence of which we can productively compare with the period from 1978 to 1982, when the Basque country was at the centre of national and national as in Spanish attention and international attention. Spain's territorial crisis has had only one real dimension, that of Catalonia against the Spanish state. And it has been the economic crisis that has become the single largest determinant of the turn to independence within Catalan society. An economic crisis inevitably means a political crisis, but it may also mean a social, cultural and identity crisis. With an economic crisis, we see how the accumulation of unrelated grievances confuse and become a potent tool for political mobilisation. This is not to suggest, for example, that nationalists can only mobilise during economic crises, or that economic grievances are underlying drivers of nationalist politics. Rather, an external shock, such as an economic crisis, is likely to lead to a search for cause, blame and responsibility, as well as solutions. An economic crisis will intensify political tensions and raise the scale of political demands. As a nation without its own state apparatus, Catalonia is placed in an unusual position as local political elites have limited responsibility in terms of how they respond to such a crisis and may be able to evade the anger of society. In general, we can note that Catalan political elites, the Catalan political class, have not been held responsible for the economic crisis. The economic crisis has actually demonstrated the comparative weakness of Catalan autonomy. The contemporary era, of course, and there's nothing new in stating this, has also been marked by a crisis of representative democracy. Dissatisfaction with political elites has grown and membership of political parties has declined. The citizenry across Europe are increasingly dissatisfied at the capacity of the democratic system to deliver. Few political narratives offer hope or the belief that meaningful political change is any longer possible. Perhaps Jeremy Corbyn, perhaps. 
The causes for this crisis have found to be deeply embedded in trends of political economy going back to the 1970s. The long post-war expansion came to an end in the early 1970s, and states resorted to two principal mechanisms to restore profitability, downward pressure on wages and borrowing. Political classes are increasingly constrained by their ability to deliver meaningful social change and have become little more than managers of political systems. Inevitably, this declining ability of the political class to respond to the economic needs of their constituents has further damaged their social credi credibility. The economic crisis shattered the belief in the inevitability of sustained social and economic progress, one of the key expressions of modernity, that a better world is possible. For most of the period of the economic crisis, it has been the Catalan national movement focused on independence that has provided an optimistic political narrative. This is a sector of society where career trajectories were ruptured, businesses collapsed, and family firms became unable to pass down the firm to the next generation. We have seen growing middle-class status anxiety at the prospect of downward social mobility, and for the first time in living memory, sectors within the middle class have directly experienced poverty. The comparative privileges of the Catalan middle classes were increasingly subject to severe strain. Some of the reasons for the discontent have been evident for some time, but were masked by a booming economy, as well as personal and state reliance on credit. Catalan independence is the political expression of middle-class discontents. And we can note that the statistically high unemployment that has been prevalent in Spain since the late 1970s, averaging 20% for most of the period since the early 1980s, significantly mostly fell on industrial workers and the young, but the middle class in Catalonia and Spain was largely spared. Furthermore, the growth of services and public employment in Spain and Catalonia after 1975 also provided new employment opportunities. The arrival of the 2008 economic crisis resulted in a dramatic loss of confidence within the Catalan middle classes, as they and their children's expectations of a stable and prosperous future were shattered. Many became a new poor, mirroring developments in Argentina, for example, in the early 2000s. Most political responses since 2008, from Brexit to right-wing populism in many European countries, have been attempts at reclaiming political and economic sovereignty. We have seen the emergence of a new category of economic patriotism, where nation states respond to the crisis. This can be, though it doesn't have to be, a protectionist response. National sovereignty and the claims to revive or restore them have been the most prominent expressions of the economic crisis and can be seen as a further example of when national identity, the national idea, triumphs over class-based politics. What with the political left, in general terms, mostly unable to respond to the economic crisis, the national community, the nation, and the defense of national identity have been the principal means of societal response. This has meant that not only the challenges to the existing economic order have largely been absent, but we have seen what we can call a defensive mobilization to protect our own, our people, and our country. Nationalism provides a social glue to society, transcending internal differentiation into social classes or interests. Catalan independence then has been able to provide this societal stability. As politics seems able to do little about socio-economic change, it can successfully mobilize around other areas. And it is here that we can situate the turn towards Catalan independence. In general terms, the Catalan mobilization for independence has not been a response to or in opposition to globalization, nor has it been a movement against the project of European integration. Spain 
or the Spanish state as a whole has come to represent what for others may be represented by the European Union or the World Trade Organization. Spain has become a hostile entity responsible for all social and political ills. The richest regions in all European countries, and Catalonia is of course a rich region, have always contributed more to the central state than the poorer regions, pretty obvious. But why has this become so markedly salient in the case of Catalonia feeding into its narrative for independence? This is to do with the fact that in the Catalan case, unlike the rich economies of Northern Europe, the region has little political say in how wealth is redistributed. In the case of Flanders, for example, in Belgium, the Belgian state has been forced over a series of decades to essentially share power with Flemish nationalism. While Northern Italy has retained capacity to influence the internal policy and dynamics of the Italian state. In the Catalan case, however, we see that 80% of regional funding is determined at the level of the central state in Madrid. And in contrast to the wealthy northern regions, the crisis has impacted on Catalonia as though it forms part of the poorer south. Therefore, the economic crisis as experienced in Catalonia was perceived as particularly unjust as it is a wealthy, not a poor region. For many Catalans, and particularly those who turned to independence, the economic crisis was a psychological trauma. Unemployment rocketed from 6% in 2006 to 24% in 2011, destroying small businesses, the self-employed, as well as affecting whole swathes of the population. One in five jobs were lost. The deep recession that hit Catalonia was a, be a bewildering convulsion that produced a widespread social sense of outrage, anger and economic despair. If the economic crisis in general terms has brought to the fore the crisis of democratic capitalism, the economic crisis has also manifested what we can call the delayed crisis of the middle class. As a social expression, the middle class is accustomed to security, easy access to employment and the transmission of these benefits to the next generation. The middle class, not only in Catalonia, but also in Spain, has been an essential component to the new politics of Spain. Podemos is inexplicable without the, the anger and the turn to politics amongst the Spanish middle classes. And the other new parties in the periphery of Spain are overwhelmingly mobilised by the middle classes. The middle class is a social group, a social cohort that provides social stability in society in exchange for prosperity. In contrast to workers for whom Economic instability has been a normal feature of their social existence since the 1970s. With the erosion of middle class privilege in Catalonia, we find that Catalan society was able to embrace a ready-made political narrative as being able to solve or perceivably solve their political problems. Jürgen Habermas, for example, noted as early as 1975 how legitimacy crises can enable mobilisation around identity, producing a number of distinctive outcomes. The economic crisis has also led to the erosion of inter- and intra-generational solidarity as Germans blamed Greeks and Catalans attributed their ills to Madrid. The crisis, the economic crisis, has been framed nationally in Catalonia. And the principal causes of the economic crisis have been directly attributed to Spain and its government. For those of you who don't know Catalan, this simply states, Spain is robbing us, which became a dominant and widely perceived and widely held perspective in the early phase of Catalan independence. I think it's no longer very important. 
Spain is robbing us, OK? The front page of a newspaper. Spain is robbing us, and now you can even say it. Significantly, with a turn to independence in Catalonia, there has been a near absence of critique of the European Union and an absence of critique of the European Union's management of austerity. The sustained basis of the Catalan sovereignty movement may simply expa be explained by the power of national identity as a collective sentiment. While in one sense Catalan independence is an anti-establishment revolt, in the real sense it is only a revolt against the Spanish establishment. Economic injustice rather, has been framed in a territorial sense, that of the Catalan economic deficit with Spain. Catalonia is a rich region, it sends more to Madrid than it gets back. The dispute is over how much it is for supporters of independence. It's, it's, expected, it's believed to be 8, 9, 10% of GDP. For critics of independence, it's maybe 4, 5%. But nobody disputes that Catalonia play, pays more into the central coffers than it gets back. During the economic crisis, then, a strong sense has emerged that only a Catalan sovereign state can repair the damage to the Catalan national community. A further element is that, as a consequence that only internally can Catalonia repair this damage, the Catalan national institutions, the parliament, the general Etat, the regional government, have seen their societal reputation enhanced, increased. The turn to independence, then, can be interpreted as a societal response to perceived injustice, unfairness and the failure of recognition. The movement for independence has come to claim for itself virtue, honesty, nobility and integrity, in contrast with the Spanish state that it has demonstrated it is unwilling to provide appropriate recognition. The appeal of Catalan independence lies in its simplicity, end the relationship with Spain and build a new Catalonia. As Catalonia has not been independent in the modern era, independence has functioned as a leitmotif in which distinct sectors of Catalan society can project their hopes and aspirations. Another Catalonia is possible. Successful political narratives work best when they can harness simplicity. And we are, of course, still living in the simplicity of a political narrative like let's take back control. Catalan independence, then, is the expression of a positive political message. It has successfully conveyed the idea of a better future through its national, through its master narrative. In this sense, a nationalist movement expresses what we can call a doctrine of destiny, through the role that faith in political change can play. Collective dignity and respect, or the experience of shame and humiliation, can contribute towards social mobilisation. And one powerful aspect of nationalism is, of course, its role in the preservation of dignity. I'm proud to be whatever it is. In a rapidly deteriorating economic context, then, only Catalan independence seemed capable of providing an opportunity of restoring this affronted dignity. When powerful emotions are aroused and discontent builds, social movements can rapidly grow and provide an output for these intense feelings. Joining together provides, its, provides the person with recognition, esteem and social ties and networks. Contemporary social movements are primarily concerned with identity and cultural values and struggles over meanings and subjectivity. Participation in rallies and demonstrations are capable in and of themselves of generating powerful emotions. Equally, amongst those who organise and play active roles in social movements, intensive satisfaction is often derived from the very act of participation. So initially, while we may see negative emotions 
as catalysts for organisation and action, we also see the emergence of more positive emotions, such as collective pride. And this transformation, if you want, from negative grievance to positive affirmation has been particularly visible in the case of Catalonia. The participation in this movement, and you know, I went through year after year, the enormous numbers. The participation in these movements has channeled enthusiasm and faith in the capacity to achieve political change. The response then to social hurt and its channeling into mobilisation has been a key expression of social psychological impulses that the nation can express. Nationalism, of course, has a large range of functions, but it has a key role in the articulation of collective grievance. And remind ourselves, as because I previously mentioned it, nationalism and national identity can offer stability in a period of turbulence. Since 2010, the Catalan Parliament has made an unprecedented series of proclamations, declarations and legislative measures proclaiming its sovereignty and primacy. From around 2011, accommodation between the Spanish and Catalan governments gradually vanished and polarisation became increasingly evident. The Popular Party in Catalonia is increasingly seen as an alien political force. It barely receives 10% of the vote in Catalonia. So remember, of course, the period when there was almost no presence of the British Conservative Party in Scotland. Under Mariano Rajoy, the current Spanish Prime Minister, support for Catalan independence exploded as the new Spanish administration was perceived to embody anti-Catalan hostility. In November 2011, when the Spanish government was formed, support for independence was found at a level 23, 24%, November 2011. By the end of Rajoy's first administration, in the summer of 2016, support for Catalan independence was hovering at figures between 45 and 50%. The movement for Catalan independence has, of course, been highly effective in terms of spectacle, publicity generation, and attention-seeking activity. The strong middle-class nature of the Catalan National Assembly, Asamblea Nacional Catalana, is reflected in the strong presence of the educated and under-representation of manual workers. Until now, or until very recently, civil dis disobedience of any kind has been largely absent as a strategy and can be seen as expressing the Catalan view of itself as an enlightened and sophisticated society. The form adopted, and we've seen the, the kind of visual images, has been that of the popular performance of mass mobilisation with the incorporation of music and folkloric expressions. Performance through visual display and the choreography of vast crowds became a form of political communication. The Catalan National Assembly has pursued the strategy to present itself as the voice of the Catalan people. And this framing of the Catalan people with the organisation as their spokesperson was inevitably that of a single entity mobilised for a single purpose. The narrative is the Catalan people are unique and separate from the Spanish, hence they must be independent. They represent an unbroken lineage of a thousand years of history and are different to Spaniards in terms of language, values and cultural practices. Thus, the people, the people represents a new way of imagining political association. The Catalan people, as represented by the forces of Catalan independence, have come to represent the Catalan people as well as the embodiment of democracy and the embodiment of democratic values. Dictatorship comes from Spain. Judicial repression of sovereignty comes from Spain. While the Catalans seek only for the will of the democratic majority to be expressed. The effect of these strategies and the effect of these narratives has been to embody the moral high ground, a superior society, if you want, held back 
by a corrupt and anti-democratic Spain. So who and what is the basis of social support for independence? Well, you don't need to know Catalan, but basically what this shows us is where you were born, OK? If you were born in Catalonia at the top and had both parents born in Catalonia, you were overwhelmingly in favour of independence, which is what the green column says. If you were born outside Catalonia or you were born in Catalonia with family ties outside Catalonia, and you can basically see born in Catalonia with one parent born in Catalonia. So there's a clear identarian element to social support. You don't need to know Catalan, it's pretty easy, and you see the exact re reverse. If you're born in Catalonia with both parents born in Catalonia, being opposed to independence is an absolutely minority position, and it grows the further down. So we see clearly expressed the data. Language and identity, then, are clear, unambivalent markers for support for independence. And age is also a strong determinant, with greater support amongst those under 40. However, as I've tried to kind of get across, social class is the most important variable to explain and account for support for Catalan independence. Social class has a directly opposite role to the role it had in Scottish independence, where independence became strongly supported by the working class in Glasgow and Edinburgh in recent years, and if you want the massive sudden growth of the Scottish National Party is inexplicable without the turn to independence amongst important segments of the Scottish working class. Pro-Catalan independence has little support from manual workers, though it has cross-class support in the small towns and interior of the country. In general terms, support for Catalan independence is at its strongest as we rise up the income ladder. Hopefully that's clear. If you earn less than two, 1,200 euros a month, support for independence, 32%. If you earn between 1,200 and 2,000 euros a month, 38%. If you earn two to 3,000 euros a month, 56%. And if you earn over 3,000 euros a month, again, rises, OK? So clearly captured there that wealth, if you want, or class location or whatever you want, class position plays a fundamental role in whether you are supportive or not of independence. How do we explain, if you want, the absence of social support amongst the poorer segments of Catalan society? We'll explain for two reasons. But firstly, to do with, in the majority of cases, to do with social origins. Many of them have strong family links with other parts of Spain. But it's also Catalan independence as a story, as a narrative, has become convincing to members of the middle class that a better Catalonia is possible. But if you're kind of like working in a factory in the outskirts of Barcelona, you absolutely do not believe that Catalan independence will do anything about your own existence, OK? So it's a major, if you want, a major societal failure of the movement for independence that is unable to appeal to what we can call the industrial or the post-industrial working class. One very important thing that's really important. As we go into the next category, I've deliberately left it off, because the top echelons, the very richest segment in Catalan society, are also quite strongly opposed to independence. If you want the, the, the elites, now it depends on your definition of elite. If you earn 3,000 euros a month, maybe you'd be perceived as being a, an elitist, I don't know. But once you get over 4,000 euros, 5,000, 6, 7,000 euros a month, support for independence precipitately drops. And this is to do with the nature of the business market in Spain. Catalan independence, then, as I've tried to argue today, is what I've called a middle class revolt, but it has also produced a fracturing within the business class in Catalonia. Small to medium-sized businesses have supported the turn to sovereignty, whilst the largest financial and economic interests are opposed. 
discordant voices, and we're hearing them ever more, have been heard from representatives of international business residents in Barcelona. And all such responses, whether it's the unwillingness of the working class, if you want, whatever you want to call it, post-industrial workers, or people earning less than 1,200 euros a month, whatever you want to call them, whether it's their unwillingness to brace independence, or whether it's the willingness of these sectors to embrace independence, or whether it's the willingness of this sector down here not to embrace independence, every single thing is to do with the articulation of economic interest. So, to finish, the Catalan question then, in spite of its own clear peculiarities, forms part of the wider political and institutional crisis experienced in Europe and beyond. Catalonia is at the epicentre of Spain's territorial crisis. Aspects of the state order in Spain have long held comparatively low legitimacy in Catalonia, such as the Spanish national flag, the Spanish monarchy, the Spanish army being principal amongst them. Since 2008, the judiciary, the Spanish constitution, and much of the state order has been added to that list. And the very existence of the Spanish nation state is in question. Resolution of the Catalan question will only occur consensually when Spain as a wider polity is prepared to embrace and welcome its internal cultural and linguistic diversity. The new narrative of Podemos, for example, around the Spanish nation is the first indicator that this change has begun, at least for the younger generation. So in general terms, Spaniards under 45 have a much more open, much more plural, much more European take, if you want, on the internal diversity in Spain. The problem is the old guard, the problem is the older generation, either educated under Francoism or taught by teachers who were educated under Francoism, who still have a very hard-line approach to the national question. For now, then, the openness to a, a, a more multi-plural, multilinguistic, multi-national Spain remains a minority position within the Spanish state as a whole. And most Spaniards continue to retain a traditional conception of the state, a traditional conception of the nation, its internal plurality and territorial integrity. The emergence of an independent Catalan state is but one option for the short and medium term future, but is not necessarily the most likely outcome. The Spanish state will never voluntarily relinquish one fifth of Spain's economy. And for now, for the present moment, Catalonia or Catalan independence lacks the political strength to break with Spain. Thank you.